Good evening and welcome to the OBI Public Talks. My name is Tom Mickelson. I'm the President and Scientific Director of the Ontario Brain Institute, or OBI. OBI is a provincially funded non-for-profit and we try to accelerate the discovery and innovation benefiting both patients and the economy. We have this team science approach that promotes brain research, commercialization and care by connecting researchers, industry, patients and their advocates, all to improve the lives of those living with brain disorders. OBI Public Talks are designed to share the latest knowledge on brain health and to offer simple tips and tricks to manage both health and wellness. With the community in mind, for this next set of Public Talks, OBI presents the Wellness Series. This series will explore the brain's vital relationship to sleep, nutrition, and physical activity. The neurotechnology, the neurotechnology that's available to help us improve our day-to-day -day lives and the importance of reducing stigma and celebrating neurodiversity. To sign up, you can find a link in our live chat box on our website. So though each of us lead different lives and spend our time in unique ways, one thing is for certain. Every one of us will spend one quarter to one third of our lives sleeping. Sleep is undoubtedly as, as essential to humans as food and water. And it can have profound impacts on our cognitive and behavioral lives during our waking hours. Interestingly, sleep is important to several brain functions, including how brain cells communicate with each other, the removal of toxins from the brain that build up while we're awake, the regulation of mood and more. Essentially, sleep has the power to define the course of our day. Over the last year, some of individuals have found it difficult to get a good night's rest, while others have slept better than ever before. So as advocates for brain health, we think that no matter how your current experience of sleep, it's never too late to learn or to think about optimizing the time you spend asleep every night. Today, our panel of experts and advocates are going to discuss the biological basis of sleep, its impact on brain health across the lifespan, and give you evidence-based information that will enable you and your loved ones to sleep better. So now moving on to the program. We're proud to be partners with TVO, and tonight's talk is being live streamed on tvo.org. A video of the talk will be made available on our website later this week. And during the talk, you can put forward questions by direct messaging on our Twitter account, at Ontario Brain, sending us an email, or typing directly into the chat box that can be found in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Details will appear on the screen soon. So for now, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Samantha Yamin. She's a neuroscientist, a science communicator, and digital media producer who shares all kinds of brain-blowing science. She's built a strong community of people with uh, her unique style of socially conscious storytelling. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you to all of you for joining us today for what's going to be a fascinating evening discussing sleep and brain health. I am so excited to be uh, your moderator today. My name is Samantha Yamin, also known as Science Sam on a few parts of the internet. And I'm a neuroscientist and science communicator. And sleep is such an important part of neuroscience and such an exciting but complicated topic. So I am so thrilled to be joined today by an esteemed panel of experts and advocates. I'll introduce them to you briefly and then we're gonna jump right in because we have lots of great topics to cover. First, we have Shelly, a retired mental health lawyer and a member of the Patient and Community Advisory Committee for the Ontario Neurodegenerative Disease Research Initiative. So excited to have Shelly with us here today. Our second panelist is Dr. Andrew Lim, who's an investigator at the same Institute Ontario Neurodegenerative Disease Research Initiative and a scientist at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. And our third panelist is Dr. Penny Corkum, a child psychologist and principal investigator for Better Nights, Better Days program, which is an online program developed by a team of sleep, sleep experts across Canada. I am so excited to chat with all of these wonderful panelists to answer some of your questions and some of the questions that um, I find fascinating about this topic. But before we jump in, I just wanna remind you all, please send in any questions that you have. Um, you'll see that you can direct message us through Twitter at Ontario Brain or tweet at us if that's easier. You can also email us at the email address on your screen right now. And if you're um, 
tuning in live, there's a chat box just to the right of your screen. You can click that little speech bubble and type in a question that you have for us in the chat, hit enter, and we'll put it into the queue and try to get to it. We'll be answering questions throughout the event as well as during a question period at the end. So please, whatever's on your mind related to this topic, we want to hear from you. Now, let's jump right in with our first panelist, Shelly. Shelly, I'm so glad to have you here today. I'm curious for you, as someone who um, is a caregiver for someone who was recently diagnosed with dementia, I'm wondering if you can let us know some of the issues, concerns, and challenges that you've been facing when it comes to navigating sleep and dementia in the context of being a caregiver and family member. Thanks, Samantha. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thanks for asking me to kick things off this evening. Um, in gathering my thoughts for this evening, I've distilled them, I believe, um, to two general questions and then um, a few examples to illustrate what my concerns are when it comes to my mother and uh, sleep. Um, just very briefly, by way of background, um, my mother, mm -hmm. like me, was always someone who needed um, more sleep than the average person. But uh, for a number of years leading up to her diagnosis, my mother became a significant chronic oversleeper. Um, although there were a few reported periods of um, undersleep as well. So I, I'd like to start, um, uh, uh, my, my first question is really to gain more understanding about the relationship between sleep and dementia. And my second question is a more practical one. And it's whether we should be letting my mother sleep as much or as little as she seems to need, or if we should um, be aiming for some optimal amount of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, those are my questions. So my examples of concern about my mother's sleep and the impact sleep could have on her life um, well, they cover the gamut um, of her physical well-being, her mental well-being, and her emotional well-being. So starting with the physical, um, also in the years leading up to um, my mother's diagnosis, she uh, was having a fall every year. And this last year, the fall was pretty bad, and it landed her in hospital and in rehab for weeks and weeks. Um, thankfully, she was released just prior to the pandemic hitting. Um, so we want to avoid more balance issues mm -hmm. and more falls in the future. And I see good sleep as an element of an important element of our preventative approach. Um, second, mental well-being. Um, my mother is an accomplished competitive bridge player. And she plays bridge daily now with COVID online and she plays with a prearranged partner. And if I can say it this way, bridge is like the jackpot for her because it's social. It contributes greatly to her quality of life. It's something she loves to do. And plus it's this rigorous cognitive daily exercise. So I want her to play bridge for as long as possible and be able to attract partners to play. Um, so I'm mindful of the connection between sleep and her ability to concentrate and to focus and to remember. Um, so things like I wonder if it's good to take a nap before you play bridge. Um, how long should that nap be optimally? Um, I know I wake up groggy after a nap. Um, then third, uh, my third concern is more forward-looking at this point and relates to her emotional well-being. And for anyone, you know, for anyone, a good sleep um, means a sense of emotional well-being the next day. Um, and I know that very well because I've had mm -hmm. trouble sleeping during COVID. So um, 
for my mother, I imagine that sleep will be important to her and contribute to her ability to emotionally self-regulate and down the roads um, will be important in terms of things like impulsivity and uh, judgment. So mm -hmm. those are my examples and my thoughts and my questions. And I'm really interested to hear what Andrew and Penny have to say on these issues. Thank you so much, Shelley, for sharing that experience that you're having in your family right now, and even some of the personal effects, which we're going to get to um, soon, how the pandemic has influenced people's sleep patterns. But I want to respond to some of the things you said, because I'm sure many of us um, can relate if we have people with dementia in our families and, and the challenges and the changes in the sleep patterns that may occur. So Dr. Lim, I, I'm wondering if if you can speak to this. We also had a question in the chat via email from someone named Mashayat, who's asking if a lack of sleep can actually cause um, damages to the brain. And I think it relates to my follow-up is, are sleep changes an early warning sign of things like dementia? Um, and can changes in sleep, especially sleep deprivation, contribute uh, or cause dementia? Or uh, based on this question, we got any, any other major issues? Dr. Lim, if you can speak to that, sure. thank you. Sure. So, so it turns out that the relationship between sleep and dementia goes probably both ways, which is to say uh, that sleep changes can be an early feature of dementia, uh, even before the onset of other features of dementia. Uh, and can be one of the more troubling symptoms of dementia uh, as, as well. Uh, and can in fact drive a lot of the care needs uh, in the later stages of dementia. Uh, but sleep can also, and sleep problems can also contribute uh, to uh, uh, to the risk of dementia uh, and to problems with cognition in the context of dementia. Um, when we think about the latter, when we think about the cognitive impact of sleep, we really think about two uh, time uh, two, two time scales at which this happens. In the short term, uh, we all know that if you don't sleep well, you have trouble paying attention and thinking uh, the next day. Uh, we also know that even in, in normal individuals, uh, sleep plays an important role in transferring memories from short-term memory to long-term memory. Uh, in the longer term, uh, we are starting to get evidence from my lab and others uh, that poor sleep can worsen brain changes that eventually lead uh, to dementia and in patients with dementia may in fact uh, lead to a faster rate of cognitive uh, decline. And there are a number of mechanisms uh, that we think uh, cause this effect. Uh, we know, for instance, now that sleep plays an important role uh, in clearing waste products and toxins from the brain. So if you don't sleep properly, now you have impaired clearance uh, of some types of metabolites and toxins from the brain that can contribute to dementia. And we also are starting to get some evidence uh, that poor sleep can lead to excess neuroinflammation uh, in the brain. And the inflammation, in turn, uh, can contribute to cognitive impairment uh, and dementia. Uh, sleep also appears to play a role uh, in regulating and improving brain blood flow. So if you sleep poorly, uh, the vessels in the brain uh, don't function as well uh, during, the, the, during the day and you have impaired brain blood flow. Uh, and finally, we know that sleep appears to play a, a role uh, in strengthening the connections uh, between brain cells that eventually lead to memory uh, consolidation. Thanks, Dr. Lim. That's so interesting because sleep is in many ways a mystery, but um, as you just described, um, there are these short-term benefits of us just feeling better and refreshed the next day, but also these longer-term benefits, clearing um, toxins, as you suggested, and being protective against um, long-term conditions like dementia. So it's all very interesting to think of the many roles that sleep may play, even though there's lots of mysteries remaining. I'm curious, Dr. Corkum, if I can bring you in here, because I'm curious uh, for your answer about how sleep impacts our moods and habits, focusing more on these shorter-term impacts of sleep. Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. It's really exciting to be here. Um, I, uh, I'm a researcher at the other end of the spectrum, so I focus on children uh, and not on the elderly. So my research is a bit different in that way. So um, what I thought I could share about uh, a little bit about is some of the research that we've done in my research lab at Dalhousie University, um, where we've actually looked at what happens for children if we take away just a small amount of sleep? So we uh, do what's called a sleep um, sleep manipulation, sleep restriction uh, protocol, where we have children uh, randomized either to have one hour less sleep per night for one week, 
or sleep kind of their typical amount of sleep. And then we look at what the impact is. And we found some really interesting results, um, both with typically developing children, as well as with children who have a neurodevelopmental disorder, such as children with ADHD. And what we found is in the sleep restricted condition, um, not only did their parents and teachers report that they were having more difficulties with their behavior, with their learning, but actually on objective measures, when we look at measuring their attention on an objective task, we could see differences with such a small amount of sleep restriction. So I think this really highlights how important sleep is for daytime functioning. Not only did we find differences in attention, but we also found differences in memory. We found differences in their ability to regulate their emotions and even in their mood level. And I think one of the more interesting findings was that the children in the sleep restricted condition actually saw the world as a little less positive. So uh, when we showed them pictures and they're quite nice pictures of like puppy dogs and ice cream and this sort of thing, um, they actually were less enthusiastic about it, less positive towards it when they were sleep restricted. So, and this is only after one hour less of sleep per night for one week. You know, I think of that as like one more TV show or one more, um, you know, activity. So it's not an uh, unusual amount of sleep restriction. We're still seeing big impacts. And then if we think of what might happen after months or years of sleep restriction, it's kind of um, scary, I think. So really highlighting the importance of good quality sleep, both the quantity as well as the quality of sleep is really important for daytime functioning. That's so fascinating, Dr. Corkum, like that just one hour, as you said, one extra show, which I, I'm face palming because I'm that person who's like, oh, just one extra episode or two or four. Uh, so I'm going to think twice before I hit next episode on Netflix tonight, because um, what you just made it clear is that there's a huge impact on mood, even from just these small changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, and uh, I mean, I don't think it's... I, I, I said, I don't think uh, one less hour a night is very abnormal. You know, it's pretty typical that we all want to watch one more show or, you know, do one more activity before we go to sleep. So, uh, and that's what we wanted to mimic was like just kind of normal amounts of sleep restriction. Uh, we knew that if you take away all the sleep, of course, you're going to have really negative impacts. But we wanted to see what's kind of what happens after just a little bit of sleep restriction. So that was really interesting. And if you think of children who already have some brain differences in terms of um, neurodevelopmental disorders, they're already struggling with these, uh, with these cognitive processes, right? So they're already having difficulties paying attention and regulating their emotions. And then if they're not sleeping well, that's going to be more challenging for them or cause more mm -hmm. impairment for them. So even more important for children who are struggling, um, you know, with these basic processes to start. Definitely. And we're going to get into some tips. I know in the chat we're seeing lots of questions about tips. We are going to get there. But I, I got to ask Dr. Lim here, why would you say sleep is important? And what big changes um, could better or worse sleep have on us? You alluded to it already, but if you can, if there's anything else um, uh, similar to what we just heard of in, in kids, really big changes or it's for the better or for the worse. Are there any things that um, that could mean long term for us? Sure. So, I mean, in in, in the short term, like uh, like Penny was alluding to, uh, sleeping poorly it just makes us feel bad and makes us perform poorly and makes our thinking and concentration worse. It makes our mood worse. Uh, so, even a few nights of bad sleep uh, uh, has short term impacts uh, on the brain. Uh, more chronically, we know that chronic bad sleep eventually can predispose to a higher risk of things like dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it also predisposes to metabolic disorders, it's a little bit outside of the Ontario Brain Institute, uh, but things like obesity uh, and diabetes and hypertension are all consequences of poor or irregular uh, sleep. So there are many, many good reasons to try and get a good night's sleep. Now we have Jeff in the chat box who says that their grandchildren have um, autism, which makes it really hard for the parents to, they stay up all night apparently is, is what happens in their case, um, which results in very little sleep for their parents. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing that. We'll get into some suggestions, but I'm wondering, Shelly, if um, from the caregiver's perspective, 
looking after someone who has dementia, have you had this similar impact on, on sleep cycle disruption as, from the perspective of a caregiver, not actually the person with dementia? Is this your experience too? It's a really good question. Um, we're still early in the journey with my mother, but um, I should say my father, first of all, is my mother's primary support. Um, um, but what I do see is that when my mother sleeps well and predictably, then my father um, also can sleep well and predictably, but importantly also, he gets um, his time of respite. So a period where he gets to do his own thing. Um, and he needs that for his own mental health and in order to give the best support he can give to my mother. And, um, and that respite is all the more critical now during COVID when, you know, we're in lockdowns and my parents essentially are cooped up 24 seven. So, um, so I see it is they're, they're, they are definitely interconnected and, um, and sleep is important to the quality of life of both my parents, that's for sure. Definitely, that segues perfectly into the next question I had, but for folks who are following along now, I wanna remind you all, please keep sending us your questions. You can send them through Twitter at Ontario Brain or email us at communications at braininstitute.ca, or you can use the chat box to the right of your screen. So please keep the questions coming. There are so many great ones and we're gonna keep uh, weaving them in as we go and as well in during the question period at the end. Now, Shelly, you brought up a great point about how the pandemic is kind of compounding these sleep challenges. So uh, Dr. Lim and then Dr. Corkum, how have sleep patterns changed during the pandemic? Do we have that evidence yet, kind of in real time? Um, have there been population level changes in our sleep? And um, if so, I'll be curious how you think we can alleviate this. Dr. Lin, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, so uh, early data are coming in now. Uh, to give an example, uh, researchers at the University of Ottawa uh, did a, a survey uh, basically, uh, of people's sleep habits before and, and after the onset of the pandemic. Uh, and what they found was actually a mixed bag. So on balance, uh, about 17% of respondents reported significantly worse sleep uh, after the pandemic. Uh, but 6% uh, but actually reported uh, better sleep. And, and I think this actually more or less reflects what I'm seeing in my own clinical practice, where there are definitely patients uh, who are coming to us uh, with worse sleep uh, since the pandemic started, but, but a sizable subset that report, for instance, that they're getting better sleep. The latter often because they're no longer needing to commute to work or show up at, at, at school uh, at a very early time and therefore are able to sleep in a little bit uh, later. That's so interesting. Uh, anecdotally, I definitely feel that. I can set my alarm a little bit later, but then it's kind of counterbalanced by uh, sometimes a little more stress. And if I had just read the news, it's harder to fall asleep. Uh, so super interesting to see that that's, that's not just my experience. Other people are having that too. And feel free to comment in the chat if that's been your experience as well. Dr. Corkum, have you seen any um, new data come in over the course of the pandemic related to your work uh, about changes in sleep during the pandemic? And if so, if you have any suggestions for uh, alleviating these changes if needed. Yeah, no, definitely an interesting question. And I agree that we're now getting some data around this, which is really exciting. I'm just gonna take a, a step back and then I will answer that question. But um, when I explain kind of the impact on daytime functioning um, of poor sleep, this led us to develop a program called Better Nights, Better Days. And it's an e-health program, which means it's delivered via the internet. And it helps parents help their children sleep better. And we did a big randomized control trial from 2016 to 2018. Uh, looking at the effectiveness and found that uh, parents were quite satisfied with the program and felt it really helped their children sleep better. So that was great. But when the uh, pandemic hit, uh, we were really curious, how were these kids doing? So these were children who had sleep problems to start. They had insomnia, so difficulty staying asleep, falling asleep, waking too early in the morning. And so we went back to that group of uh, parents and we asked. And what we found was that 40% of those children were sleeping much worse than they had 
pre-pandemic. Uh, and so that was uh, uh, d discouraging to hear that so many were struggling, but there was a small group that we're doing better. So it is a mixed bag. What I was really uh, interested in was that 60% of parents were sleeping worse. So parents are really carrying a brunt of this uh, pandemic. They're not only trying to work at home, but you know, deliver sometimes educational uh, supports and programs and, and they're not sleeping really well. And we know sleep is a family affair. If parents aren't sleeping well, then probably children are not. And if children are not sleeping well, then parents are not. So, so it really, uh, struck us that there's a big need to help families during uh, the COVID-19 crisis and help them help them sleep better and help them to help their children sleep better. So we actually modified our Better Nights, Better Days program um, for the COVID context. And on uh, March 19th, which is World Sleep Day, we're going to be launching this. Uh, and so parents across Canada can participate and learn how to help their children sleep better, especially during this uh, challenging time. And also within this program are tips for parents as well, because we really do see it as a family, a family affair. We really have to work on not only the children's sleep, but also the parents' sleep. I really encourage, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Corkum. I encourage people to check out Better Nights, Better Days, and it's um, on the Ontario Brain Institute website. We have a list of resources for today's conversation, and it is listed as one of the resources where people can learn more. But I'm wondering if you can give us a, a little sneak peek of a tip, uh, something that people can do or avoid um, to improve their sleep if they're in that category of people experiencing worse sleep during the pandemic. Just a sprinkle, yeah, just sure. one example. <laughs> yeah, sure, no worries. Um, I think what, I'm gonna say what parents told us. So when we did the survey of the families who had previously been in our trial, what we found was that the ones that were sleeping well, the children who were sleeping well and the parents are sleeping well, what they were doing is really trying to maintain routine in their life. And I think you alluded to that a few minutes ago that if you get off routine, it kind it's hard to sleep. And so the families that were doing the best, and we say that they were thriving in a difficult time, they actually were really good at keeping a routine, not only a nighttime routine, but a daytime routine. Because we know that, you know, what you do during the day affects what, how you sleep at night and how you sleep at night affects your daytime functioning. So keeping a routine is really critical. Um, and, and you could change the routine a little. Maybe you can get up a little bit later than usual because you don't have to drive to work or you don't have to uh, do some of the things that you were doing before. But it does have to be consistent um, over time and each day. So that's really important. And the second thing I'd say is critical is screen time. So the parents who are really struggling more reported using a lot more screens and their children were using a lot more screens. So TV, computer, tablets, smartphones, et cetera, um, especially kind of an hour before bed, really limiting that. So the, the families that weren't doing that were, were struggling more with sleep. So I would really look at the electronics. Well, I'm guilty on both counts. So <laughs> your, your <laughs> tip for us was to incorporate a better routine and to avoid screens in the last hour before bed. <laughs> we'll see if I'm able to do that today. Um, Dr. Lim, I'm curious uh, if you have something that we should do or avoid for better sleep. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that, that I mean, a critical part of that routine is getting adequate amounts of physical activity. Uh, especially outdoor physical activity, because one big impact of the pandemic is we're spending, uh, especially folks who maybe live in, in apartment buildings and, and don't have access to a private outdoor space, we're spending less time outdoors and getting less physical activity. Uh, and these are both important uh, signals for the body's biological clock uh, that set and regularize the biological clock and therefore allow sleep to happen uh, on a regular schedule. Uh, without the, re the regular physical activity and outdoor uh, light exposure, it's very hard to settle into uh, a regular biological clock. Thank you for that. Shelley, I'm, I'm curious what your experience has been because I understand um, you've been dealing with a double anxiety and I just wanna commend you for all that you've been you know, um, surviving through this past year. It's been a difficult year for everyone. And you've been dealing with this pandemic as we all have and the anxiety related to health challenges in the family, which um, I can relate to. We had some issues in the family last year with health. And it, it's just, it's a unique type of anxiety. So I'm just wondering how, you, how you've been um, dealing in, 
and how your sleep has been with these double um, challenges. And I'm sure you're not alone and there are others in the chat too who can relate. Yeah. Um, well, it was quite concerning to me a couple of months ago, I would say. I was finding that many nights I was waking in the middle of the night and for the first time ever in my life, I um, mm -hmm. woke feeling such acute anxiety that I couldn't fall back to sleep. And um, at first I did the big no-no, I grabbed my Kindle and I would read, uh, trying to get myself to slip back into sleep. Um, but I would wake up feeling groggy, like I hadn't slept well. And, um, and I would often wake up with a sore jaw, indicating that I had been clenching at night, which mm -hmm. was also new for me. Um, but I've found um, better strategies since that I can share. Um, yes, so please. one, um, so one, I, I picked up yoga again and I'm doing it in my home. Um, and then I took a great suggestion from a doctor and I, um, have started to do progressive muscle relaxation, which is a way to teach the body to relax. And those two practices have, um, sort of ratcheted down the level of anxiety in my life and um, it's translated into better sleep. So, I'm, but I, I so am not getting to bed early. <laughs> I admit that, that's still a problem. I think we can all admit that we've done some of the no-nos. <laughs> I think we're, you know, uh, it, it's natural and it's okay if anyone else is realizing, oh, I've been doing things I shouldn't have. But I am so thrilled to hear, Shelly, that you found some um, really implementable solutions, uh, yoga and this muscle relaxation, which came out of a, a conversation with your healthcare provider, which I really encourage folks who are, who are struggling. I know there's some people sending us in questions, dealing with insomnia, pain-related sleep disturbances, um, really fantastic tips that you provided, Shelly, to talk to your doctor and see what they can offer um, and practice these relaxation techniques if, if they're relevant. Um, I'm also, I have another question for you, Shelly, how your perspective has changed now that you've been on both sides in this way, um, just switching gears a bit, You've acted as legal counsel for, for patients before, and now you're kind of on the other side where you're more on the family uh, caregiver side of things. And has that kind of changed the way that you look at these situations um, of patient advocacy uh, related to things like dementia? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'll tell you a story. Um, my mother's doctor um, uh, suspended her driver's license. And you can imagine the blow this was to her sense of independence and autonomy. And knowing that I represented patients' rights as a mental health lawyer, my mother um, approached me and asked me to advocate for her to get her license back. But the truth was that I was very relieved that the doctor had suspended it. And I felt that the decision was really in her best interests. So I had to do a very heartbreaking thing. And that was to tell my mother that I could not be her advocate. And it was really the first time for me that I found myself opposing a patient rather than advocating for the patient. And then on top of it, this was my mother. Um, so it, it was a real perspective shifter for me. And I definitely have a better understanding and a lot more compassion for families navigating the health system, especially where they're in conflict or disagreement with their loved ones. Thank you so much for sharing that. It really goes to show that our brain health really 
um, permeates into so many levels of our lives. It permeates into our moods, as we've discussed. Our sleep patterns can also impact our moods. Um, our long-term brain health is, is of, of course, very important as well. And then there's the legal layer of how uh, changes in our brain health can impact our day-to-day -day lives. And that's why this conversation is so important. And I'm so grateful to hear these different perspectives because we can see that these are these are multifaceted challenges and one's inability to sleep can also impact um, their ability to drive, for example, um, compounded with other conditions. And, and this just now makes what may seem like something simple like sleep become such a large large discussion and, and really impact quality of life. So thank you, Shelly, for, for sharing that. Um, we have a ton of fantastic audience questions, and I encourage them, encourage you to keep sending them in because we are going to get through uh, a lot of them. Before we jump to that, Dr. Lim, I want to ask you, are there any myths or misconceptions related to sleep that we need to address tonight to help us live well? <laughs> Well, I, th I think one important misconception is that poor sleep and sleepiness is just a part of normal aging. So, I mean, it's very easy to take a look at grandma and say, you know, look, she only sleeps a few hours a night and, and maybe naps a, a ton during the day, but that's a normal part of aging. Uh, and and the, the answer is it, it, it isn't necessarily a normal part of, of aging. Uh, I like to, to say to my patients uh, that normal sleep uh, is if you're able to uh, fall asleep relatively easily, say within half an hour, uh, sleep through the night, waking up no more than a couple of times uh, at, at night, getting anywhere between six and a half to nine hours of sleep at night. And then you're able to make it through the day, even in sedentary situations like watching the television uh, without napping. Uh, so if you're able to do that, then sleep is probably okay. Uh, but if you're not, it may be worth uh, looking wh whether there are things that can be changed uh, to improve sleep. Uh, we talked about a bunch of these already. There are a bunch of things you can try yourself, uh, like having a more regular sleep schedule, having a pre-bed routine, getting lots of physical activity uh, during the day, lots of outdoor time, uh, addressing issues uh, like anxiety. Uh, but if, despite addressing these things, uh, you're still having poor sleep, it's worthwhile bringing it up uh, with, for instance, your family doctor, because there are very many common sleep disorders, things like sleep apnea or restless legs uh, that are entirely treatable uh, that have left untreated uh, can have important consequences for the brain uh, and uh, and that can really only be detected with formal testing. Thank you for that. That's a really important um, myth for us to bust and for us to keep in mind that um, it's not just normal. Uh, and if it if it's really starting to feel like a problem, it's a good time to discuss with your healthcare provider because uh, you're right. A lot of us think, yeah, that's just what happens, but that may not always be true. So now I'm excited to launch into the Q&A portion of the, of the evening and get into some of our audience questions. One is a great follow-up into what we've just been chatting about. It comes from Craig via Twitter, who's wondering, you gave us all these great tips um, related to having a routine, limiting screen time, but Craig's wondering, are naps during the day a good idea or could they impact how well one sleeps at night? Dr. Corkum, do you have any insights on that? I think it matters um, what age range you're talking about. So obviously with young children, uh, naps are common and important and, and what we need to ensure that they get in order to get enough sleep during the 24 hour period. In a healthy, um, you know, older child and, and adult, um, we probably shouldn't need to nap during the day if we're getting good sleep. Um, you know, I, I think having to nap is an indicator that you're actually not getting good sleep. So um, rest is good, you know, having time to relax and and unwind a bit uh, here and there through the day is really important. But you probably shouldn't have to sleep to feel good uh, during the daytime. But I'd be interested in Dr. Lim's uh, thoughts uh, from a perspective of older adults. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add in, thank you, Dr. Corkum, Dr. Lim, before you uh, give your reply, uh, Craig also has mentioned that um, they have PTSD and general anxiety. So I don't know if that changes things, um, knowing that and what answer you to give about naps. Sure. So, so I, I agree with Penny, which is that 
uh, otherwise completely healthy adults, even older adults who have no other medical conditions, uh, shouldn't for the most part need to nap during the day if their sleep at night is adequate. Uh, and in fact, a new onset of a need to nap can be an indicator of a new medical problem that needs to be looked uh, into. Uh, for instance, um, a new napping uh, can be, or change in, in the need to nap can be uh, an indicator of early Alzheimer's disease. Uh, to give an example, it could be an indicator of things like sleep apnea or other medical problems, hormonal problems. Uh, so I do think that a, a new onset of a need to, to nap does need to be uh, looked into. Uh, that said, uh, once all of these things have been looked into and say it turns out that you have a uh, uh, an underlying medical problem, uh, then you might need that nap uh, as, as a consequence of, of that medical uh, problem. So, so the, the nap itself may not necessarily be a bad thing, but it might be a warning sign uh, of other underlying problems that need to be uh, looked into. It's a little bit different in people who have uh, insomnia, uh, where excessive daytime napping uh, can lead to uh, a, a loss of regularity of the biological clock. Uh, and, and therefore worsen the insomnia. Uh, so the, the one instance where the daytime nap uh, can uh, make things worse uh, is in patients who have insomnia. Thank you. Um, David asked via Twitter, it's a related question here, but if there's any data on whether quality of sleep changes depending on timing. So let's say if you're someone who's early to bed and early to rise versus someone who sleeps late and then sleeps in. Have, has anyone so, seen any uh, data related to that? I'm, I'm curious. Sure, so, so I mean, the key thing actually is to sleep in synchrony with your biological clock. Uh, so this has been looked at, at in experiments where um, uh, uh, people have been allowed to sleep or, or forced to sleep at different uh, phases of their biological clock. Uh, and what we know is that if you sleep in sync with your biological clock, whatever that is, uh, the sleep is of higher quality, you get more REM sleep, you get more uh, deep sleep. Uh, whereas if you sleep out of sync with your biological clock, uh, the sleep tends to be light and fragmented. And the most extreme example of this uh, is uh, in jet lag, for instance, where all of a sudden you're, you're trying to sleep completely out of sync with your biological clock and sleep is often very light uh, and fragmented in, in that context. Uh, what this means, though, uh, is that the ideal sleep time might be different uh, for different people. So there are some people who are relatively uh, late sleepers and late risers. Uh, these folks, if forced to sleep early, may in fact get uh, light and fragmented sleep by being forced to sleep too early. Whereas uh, morning larks, uh, if if um, if forced to, to stay up too late and sleep late, we'll get a light and fragmented sleep in that context. So the important thing is to sleep in sync with your own biological clock. Dr. Corkum, do you have anything you want to add to that about um, time of sleeping, whether it's early to early or late to late? Yeah, sure. So for children, um, they tend not to be as... Uh, defined as larks and owls. So morning people or evening people, that sort of happens as we, uh, you know, as we age, especially after adolescence. Um, so what we know with younger children is that if they go to bed later, uh, then, you know, there's this magic number, 9 p.m. for young children. And we've done research that shows that children who go to bed later than that actually have uh, poor daytime functioning than children who uh, go to bed before nine or at or before nine o'clock at night. And so there does seem to be some um, evidence uh, for the need to go to bed at a, a good time. Um, I'd say the other piece, and I think, uh, you know, as Dr. Lim had mentioned, it's really important to be in sync with your clock, um, especially during adolescence. This is really difficult because we actually have a biological shift in our circadian clock, what makes us sleep. And so for adolescents, their, their um, biological clock is changing. They biologically want to go to bed later, but school's still early. And so they can get um, quite... Uh, off rhythm and it can lead to um, some sleep disorders, uh, circadian clock dis sleep disorders and even insomnia. So um, a big risk time is during uh, in the baby uh, period and then again in adolescence. Uh, and these are the two times that the, the biological or the circadian clock is really um, 
changing or being formed. And, and those times we have to be really careful around our consistency with routines and schedules. Thank you for that. I think both of your answers. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Lim. Eight o'clock school start time in high school is, is a really bad policy. <laughs> I support that. I'm also not a morning person, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think both of your answers actually addressed a question that um, Roger had put in the chat box. Um, Roger was wondering, why can't you build up a sleep surplus in the same way that you do with sleep debt? You can really feel it when you haven't slept for several days and, and you're like, I need a good night's sleep. But how come if I sleep for 16 hours? I'm not good to get just two hours the next few days. I think what you mentioned about the circadian rhythms and it being cyclical kind of speaks to that, but does anyone want to uh, elaborate briefly? So, um, so Dr. Lim, answer, I'll so these to you. Yeah, sure. So, so these experiments have been done. Uh, and in, in the, the answer is you actually can build up a little bit of a sleep uh, surplus in that if you go into uh, uh, a period of sleep deprivation after, say, like a week of, of complete sleep repletion, you're actually a little bit more uh, resilient to the effects of the sleep deprivation after that. So you actually do build up a little bit of a buffer, uh, but but it's not like you can sleep, you know, 48 hours and then go for, you know, 48 hours without sleep. It doesn't really quite work uh, uh, that way. Now, Linda's asking, is there something to add or something to not do during the day as part of your routine that may lessen the severity of a rhythmic movement disorder in a child with cerebral palsy? So we're getting a lot of questions here about specific conditions and how they impact sleep. So um, I don't know, Dr. Corkum, if, if you have any um, participants in your work with cerebral palsy that, that may help here. Yeah. That's a, it's always hard to talk about specific uh, yeah. cases or examples because they're always complex and a lot of um, individual factors. I mean, definitely pain can be a big factor for children with CP in terms of their sleep. And so making sure that the pain is well managed uh, and doing whatever it takes during the daytime to ensure that pain management, I think, can be really helpful for sleep. It's one of the most common reasons that they, uh, children with CP have more challenges with falling asleep and staying asleep. Thank you for that. Shelly, I'm curious um, here in your experience, have I know you mentioned um, the yoga. Are there any other things during the day that you've just found in your personal experience uh, tend to be a helpful part of your routine uh, and help with your getting back to sleep or getting to sleep at night? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I mentioned these two practices. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, well, I don't do yoga in the evening. I tend to do it um, uh, in the morning or early afternoon, um, and um, and this progressive muscle relaxation, which I can't say enough good about, um, I can do any time of the day, and. Um, in fact, I can even do it while in bed, but I, I do it any time of the day in a quiet moment. And it just sort of teaches your body what it feels like to be relaxed. And it, it's like it gives you a body memory of relaxation that you can then um, tap into when you need to. Thank you for sharing that. It's always nice to hear what different people find um, helpful, especially when it's a behavioral change that um, might be kind of easy to, to test out. So thank you, Shelly. Um, we got a question via Twitter from DRC. We're setting the clocks forward next weekend. What strategies can you recommend for easing the pain of the time change when we spring forward, <laughs> um, given that the school and work schedules move an hour earlier in a heartbeat? Thank you for asking this because I struggle with this every year. <laughs> Dr. Lim, do you have any thoughts about this? Sure. So, so a, a couple of pieces of advice. I mean, one uh, is is to consider uh, sleeping just a little bit earlier, uh, a couple of days even before the big change. So sleeping early and waking up earlier, maybe 20 minutes 
a, a couple of days before, or 40 minutes, a couple of days before, 20 minutes, uh, uh, or, or sorry, 20 minutes, a couple of days before, for, then 40 minutes, and then 60 minutes. So you ease yourself into it. Uh, so easing into it gradually is, is one uh, piece of advice. Uh, the second thing is to try and get a good amount of morning light and morning physical activity, uh, because that'll go a long way towards advancing your biological clock uh, as well. So if the change is happening on a Sunday, uh, you might uh, schedule in on Friday morning and Saturday morning, a bit of a morning walk, especially if the weather's nice. I love that. That sounds nice and, and helpful for our sleep, but also just nice to throw in extra walks. <laughs> That's a great idea. Dr. Corkum, do you have any advice, um, maybe particularly for parents with young ones at home and how they can deal with this time change coming up? Yeah, so uh, our recommendations are very similar, kind of eased into it, start, you know, a week before, maybe not in 20 minute increments, but like say 10 minute increments, um, going to bed 10 minutes earlier for, you know, a week before starting that and the time that the change happens, you're almost there. And then going back to that circadian clock, which is such an important part of our sleep, um, it is set by light. That's something that's really important to remember. And so getting that bright light, natural light in the morning can really help set the clock. And so think of it kind of like jet lag in a way, right? Really, it's like a bit of jet lag when the when the time uh, changes and having that bright light can help set, uh, reset our clock and help us kind of manage that change a bit uh, better. Thank you. I, I like that we can kind of make it an event <laughs> like this is coming up. So kids, we're going to change our sleep time and, and then it can feel maybe more exciting instead of scary, even though nothing really happens besides the clocks change. <laughs> but um, I like this idea of le leading up to it gradually, making it an event. We all need something exciting to look forward to. Um, I want to ask all of you, since you're, you've been so wonderfully helpful, and I'm so glad we got to get through so many questions. But if each of our panelists can give all of us listening today one quick tip um, everyone could incorporate for how they can improve their sleep tonight or tomorrow if it needs a little more time. Uh, <laughs> Shelly, what's your tip for our, for our group? Um, well, first, I just want to thank OBI and Andre for <laughs> including me tonight um, and Andrew and Penny and Samantha. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, for me personally, um, I guess it's no surprise at this point, but I'm going to talk about progressive muscle relaxation. Google it. If you don't know what it is, there are lots of resources on the internet and um, it's super easy to do. You don't need anyone to, to be there with you, to guide you. It's free and it's not time consuming. That's my tip. Actually, before we move on, Dr. Lim, is there anything you can tell us about this? Um, I don't know if you've if encountered this progressive muscle relaxation before. Uh, I'm just curious because we've heard about it. <laughs> right. So, so I mean, I think really, you know, anything that's going to take the edge off anxiety, which is one of the biggest contributors to poor sleep in modern society, is going to help. Uh, for some people, it might be progressive muscle relaxation. For others, it might be yoga. Uh, for others, uh, it might be meditation uh, or mindfulness. I think all of these things uh, are big parts of addressing the anxiety that's out there these days. Uh, it can help sleep in that regard. I will give a plus one for mindfulness. Uh, I've been doing it on my own with different apps on my phone. And I also got a book that gets me to do five minutes every day. And um, it's it's just so it, it's interesting just to pay attention. And it also um, is so helpful for so many things. So I, I'm going to also up mindfulness as a, a recommendation and easy thing to try. It doesn't take too much time. Um, Dr. Corkum, what's your one tip for something folks can do today to um, have better sleep and wellness? <laughs> well, I'm going to be a bit repetitive, I think, but I really would <laughs> say uh, even though we live in a digital age, you can access electronic stuff 24 seven. It's really challenging to move away from it. But if you really wanted to make a big difference in your sleep, I think that's where you start and we prioritize that when we're working with children. Um, so we do do things like muscle, rela 
muscle, progressive muscle relax, relaxation, um, deep breathing, these kinds of activities. But um, our number one, where we usually start is electronics. Are you not, not to use them in bed, in your bedroom, an hour before bed, um, really can make quite a big difference. Hard to do, I know, <laughs> but, but <important. laughs> at night is when I doom scroll through Twitter. So you're telling me I shouldn't I read devastating, <laughs> scary news before bed. <laughs> yeah, when I say right. that loud, it does it does make a lot of sense. <laughs> You'd think I would yeah. know better, <laughs> well, for whatever I think reason. That's, that that's the point that there's really two reasons that we can't use uh, electronics. One is the light um, that is being emitted, which again, when we talked about light setting our circadian clock, so that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that often when we're using electronics, it's incre increasing our arousal level. And, you know, it's making us uh, scared or anxious or, or excited, but it's, it's winding us up. And to go to sleep, you need to be calm. And so uh, if you're going to use them, first thing in the morning is a great time. You know, look at the scary stuff or do something exciting. It'll get you going. <laughs> then go for a nice walk. But at nighttime, try not to use it. First thing in the morning when my cortisol is already high, my stress hormone <laughs> just add to it and doom scroll. Yeah, I love going. that. But I, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> All of these tips really fit together nicely. Routine because of our circadian rhythm, um, being mindful of too much light in the evening because we're trying to keep that rhythm and that routine. Relaxation because we don't want to have peak stress right before bed because that doesn't help us to fall asleep. Uh, so all of these things, I mean, I know people may hear, may have heard some of them before, but they all really do fit in with the latest research on um, sleep and how it impacts our brain health. Dr. Lim, I, I kind of, um, I don't know if I gave you the full chance to say your one big tip, but do you have any last words you wanted to add there? I was just going to reinforce the importance of regularity and routine. Uh, so having the same bedtime and the same wake time every day, especially on weekends. So a lot of people will have a routine during the week and they kind of mess it up on the weekends uh, and then have a horrible, almost like social jet lag uh, on Monday. But to keep that routine every day is an important part uh, of, of having healthy sleep. Uh, and part of that routine should be uh, regular exposure to bright light, especially in the morning, uh, and regular physical activity. Thank you all so much. Those are really helpful tips. I have taken notes because I have a lot of things I need to work on when it comes to improving this regularity and improving this. And we got some great suggestions for things we can try to help with relaxation, help with routines and rhythms. Um, thank you everyone in the chat. It was such a lively discussion and so many great, so many great questions from so many inquisitive minds, which is lovely to see. I do want to remind you all that we have resources to share with you. I know there were more questions than we could tackle, so don't worry. We have some fantastic resources on the Ontario Brain Institute website, lots of links where you can learn more about the things that each of our panelists brought up, and more generally on the science of sleep and how it relates to brain health. So I encourage you to check those out. I also want to say that as a viewer, we're so grateful that you joined us today and that you're excited to learn more about the brain and your feedback is very, very valuable to us. So there's going to be a survey link in the chat box. Um, you might see it there already. Please click on it and share your thoughts with us about tonight's talk and what you learned, because that's always very helpful um, for running future events. I'll remind you that OBI Public Talks are designed to share the latest knowledge on brain health and to offer simple tips to manage both health and wellness. OBI presents the next set of public talks, the Wellness Series. The series will explore the brain's vital relationship to nutrition and physical activity, the neurotech available to help us improve our day-to-day -day lives, and the importance of reducing stigma and celebrating neurodiversity. These are all topics that are of um, high interest to me, and I'm sure you would agree. And if they're new areas for you, you have to tune in because you're going to learn so much and get so excited about the current status of brain research and also what's ahead in store for us. To sign up for any of these talks in the upcoming wellness series, you can find a link in the chat box or on our website. Thank you again to our fantastic panelists and our listeners, and I wish you many, many happy nights of sleep.